Hello, everybody. This is Laura Andrews um, from the Art Department at Riverland Community College. I am excited to introduce a group of artists who teach and illustrate at MCAT, Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And um, the show that they are participating in is called Personal Work, and it is curated by Allison Novak. We are lucky, admit somebody, um, we are lucky to have, um, please correct me if I pronounce anybody's name wrong, Jacob Gates, Kelsey King, and Jamie Anderson joining us today. And they're gonna talk about um, their work and their process. And then I have some student questions that I will share kind of closer to the end of the talk. So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, just so that everybody knows kind of when and where the show is, this is the web page for the gallery and it includes a little bit of information about the show and then the gallery hours and then just different samples of folks' work. Um, the show will be open through, I believe, December 29th and the gallery hours are Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then I think I'm gonna hand it over to Allison because um, she's the curator for the show and then she can kind of take it from there and handing off the baton. Thanks, Allison. All right, thanks, Laura. Okay, so welcome to our little artist talk. Um, I think my plan for today was to just um, walk through the samples of art of the folks who aren't here uh, just fairly quickly talk a tiny bit about the piece I have in the show and then turn it over to our other three artists who are here to talk about their work. Um, so let's kick that off. I'm going to share my screen. Um, go. One second. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah, perfect. Right. It's like we're back in the pandemic. I haven't done a Zoom in a while. Okay, so um, yeah, here we are all together. And I thought I'd start with Brian's work. Um, so Brian um, is someone who does a lot of work for posters to park posters for parks, um, which is a show that creates limited edition posters by local artists and designers. And um, it's kind of a great fundraiser for the parks themselves. Um, as well as the artists. Um, so another one there. And then this third one with the squirrel actually um, was selected for the Society of Illustrators annual exhibition in New York this year. So it's kind of exciting for him. Yay, Brian. So that was his work that he contributed. Oh, and I should say too, kind of my idea behind the show was just... Um, as illustrators, a lot of times we're doing more commercial work or we're doing work that we don't have kind of like full artistic control over, um, um, are doing a lot of collaborating, which is amazing, but sometimes you don't get to kind of have your full vision yourself as well. And so um, the idea of kind of doing a personal work show is to just sort of show um, when people do have full artistic control over what they're doing and um, working with kind of some of the choices they they make and the kind of work they produce. Um, yeah, this one by Dana. Um, I ended up digging into the research a little bit about this amazing pool in Iceland. It's apparently the oldest pool in Iceland and it is built um, into a hot spring. So there's no like chemicals or anything. It just kind of like water flows in and out of it. And there's this sort of concrete structure that contains it and you just hike into the mountains there's like not even like any sort of directional anything telling you how to get there you just have to have someone who knows how to get there tell you how to get there and then you end up kind of in this hot springs in the mountain and it stays it's open year round no one's really sort of it's almost like half wild like there's nobody who really controls it you just kind of like walk there and get in if you want and it may or may not be like clear 
like it's almost like a more of a natural thing at this point but anyway kind of super super interesting history and I think she had done um a bunch of illustrations on pools and this is this is the one she picked to be in the show and then this is an illustration by Sam Calda um he was um, just sort of like working with creative prompts and he used a prompt by John Hendricks, who's another illustrator, um, to make a list of 100 things he likes to draw. And then from there, um, he had taken um, inspiration from that list to basically create this piece of work. Um, and I think the plan was just to use it for promotion. I think he sent it to his agency. Um, but I think that's a great idea. I always tell students to like, make sure you are um, promoting yourself with the kind of work you actually like making, because that is what you will get more of. So I think doing an exercise like this, where you really think about like, what is it I really like to draw and kind of crystallizing that um, is a really interesting exercise. Um, yeah, so really enjoy that as well. Um, and then this work by Sarah Fowler, so fun. It's like gouache, watercolor, colored pencil. Uh, the title of the work is I'm for Looking Out the Window. And Sarah does a lot of work that's kind of about like play and humor, humanity, poetry. Um, so this piece is tiny. It's maybe about the size it is on the page um like in the show maybe slightly bigger but um yeah really fun piece by sarah so those are the artists um other than myself who are are not here who all submitted work to the show so thank you so much to all of them um and one of the things i really like about illustration is just kind of getting that really amazing cross-section of um types of work people make, types of mediums people use, and just seeing how everyone kind of puts that together differently um, is really exciting. And it's kind of fun to see how all of these different people who, you know, have a practice, teach, kind of um, have all these sort of aspects to how they're making, um, put things together. And then this is my piece that I put in the show and um, definitely personal work. Um, at the time, because I was teaching watercolor, I was just like working on my watercolor skills. And um, I think it's nice when you are just kind of like working on skill building, just doing something that your brain finds interesting or attractive, whether or not you're um, super sure it's going to make good art. You know, I think if it just like is engaging for you, that's kind of the main thing. And um for some reason, whenever I really like a particular song, I always end up feeling like I want to illustrate the person singing it. I'm not sure what that is about exactly, but that is the impulse. And so I was doing that at this moment with watercolor because that's what I was working with. And um, so this is an illustration of Grimes um, from the music video Flesh Without Blood. Um or I guess the song for the music video, Flesh Without Blood. And she is um, in a very like uh, Marie Antoinette scenario in, in the video. Um, yeah, and I painted it and didn't feel like I liked how it turned out very much and kind of put it away um, for some months. And then I ended up coming back in and sort of like, digitally just putting in some more shadows and kind of just creating a little more dimension in the figure. And then I ended up um, liking it quite a bit. So I think sometimes too, it's like if your work doesn't quite work out the way you want it to immediately, um, just giving yourself a little bit of space and time to like let it percolate and see what it needs um, can be really helpful. Um, and also, you know, not limiting yourself in terms of process, just because you made something in watercolor doesn't mean you have to stay there. Um, you can always, you know, kind of use all your other digital tools to kind of um, make it, make it what you want it to be in the end. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I'll say about that for right now. Um, I think from here, um, I will get, yeah, because I think the next step is Jamie. So I will get out of my um slideshow here 
Um, let me just stop sharing. All right, we're back. And then I think if it's all right, I was thinking um, we could go Jamie, Jacob, Kelsey in terms of order, just so we don't have to all be in suspense. Um, <laughs> and Jamie, if you're cool with being first, I will just um, volunteer you, you to go first. Sure, sure. All right. And um, are y'all able to see that? Okay, great. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Allison and Laura. Thank you so much for um, helping to put this show together. It's really fun to be a part of it with all these really talented illustrators. And I'm going to try to go quick because I don't want to take up uh, a whole lot of time. So um, hi, everybody. I'm Jamie. Um, I work as a freelance illustrator, and I also teach at MCAD with um, these fine folks. Um, I'll just kind of walk through a couple of different techniques that I use. Um, in illustration. So um, sometimes I will just work with a traditional sketch and then bring that into um, Photoshop and just experiment with laying down flat color, um, sometimes texture. Sometimes I'll go in and start with digital line and then add digital color and textures. So mostly a digital, um, a digital fan, I guess, um, but I do like to incorporate kind of mixed media when I can. Um, I also love to explore, uh, procreate, kind of experiment with their sketch tools, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, this was for a show here at MCAD, a faculty show uh, during 2020, which um, this, I guess, captures that <laughs> time and place. Um, huge fan of the lasso tool, I would say. Um, in Photoshop, I, I tend to get kind of overwhelmed with all of the choices of the variety of brushes that are available to us. So I tend to just gravitate towards the most basic brush. And um, and I use the lasso tool um, quite a bit. So here's an example of that, just kind of using it to create these really fluid shapes. Um, this was for a collaborative zine called Illo Zine, which is um, organized by Jim O'Brien. Um, the theme for that one was loud. So kind of a general uh, prompt, and then just up to you to kind of come up with your own interpretation. Um, and then I kind of experimented with making this a risograph as well, which is a, a printing process that mimics screen printing, but it's toner-based um, inks that are very vivid and fluorescent. Um, kind of fun to experiment with. Um, sometimes if I'm uh, feeling bold enough to tackle like vector illustration, I'll explore that a little bit. Um, this is for a collaborative calendar for Studio on Fire, which is a local letterpress um, studio. The theme for this one was Guilty Pleasures. Um, so I illustrated Skinny Dipping and um, ABBA and No Shame, right? That was great. Um, and then I'll walk through real quick, just um, kind of typical process that I worked through. This was for an editorial for the Walker um, Art Museum. They're um, a quarterly magazine that they put out and it was all about a kid's film festival. So it starts like this, super messy, really chaotic, um, and just draw a lot of like icons and uh, gather reference imagery. I knew I wanted a uh, possum as a little studio director, so he made the cut. Um, somehow that all gets organized into this more kind of rough uh, composition. And then I'll throw some color blobs in there and then um, kind of tighten it up and work big. And then with editorial, often um, you might be working with type as well or needing to accommodate those um, spaces. Um, I also participate in a lot of poster shows with one of them is the um, Posters for Parks, which Brian was also a part of. Um, this one was Art Crank. This was a poster show for biking enthusiasts. Um, a little snapshot of process, which I will show my students. I'm not embarrassed to like some of these only make sense to me. Some of them are embarrassing, like bike in a jello mold. Toss away. Why? <laughs> Why is that even on there? Um, and then working uh, with a kind of larger rough sketch and then a tighter sketch, uh, exploring color. And then the final, which was a screen print. Um, so those are a lot of fun. I always recommend participating in poster shows if that's of interest to you. It's a great way to uh, meet people and kind of network. Um, these are a couple for posters for parks. That was the first and last time my dog was on a paddleboard. Never do that again. <laughs> Uh, screeching Owls uh, near Lake Harriet last summer. So a lot of fun. And then uh, the Growler, which is one of the pieces that I have in the show. Um, I'll walk through this really quick, but the art director um, emailed me and kind of sent this image, which I had already made 
on the top left and they were just sort of drawn to that and wanted to recreate it for their magazine. Um, so it was all about craft beer and camping. So it just started with reference, thumbnailing, and then typically you send off three rough sketches. So these are my roughs. Um, he picked the one in the middle, but since he was a cub, former Cub Scout leader, he asked that I put the fire out because that was irresponsible and then move the fish because um, it might attract bears. So cleaned up those little details and there you go. So that was a lot of fun. And then another piece I have in the show is um, a piece I did for the Resist uh, magazine, which again was a collaborative um, call for art uh, zine. And there was a list of themes you could pick from. I picked my body, my choice. And the art director for that uh, project is Fran uh, Francois Moulet. She's the art director for The New Yorker. Um, so my thought was if I maybe participate in the zine, would she potentially reach out for a call for art um, for the New Yorker and um, she did, which was fun. So the New Yorker is, um, they kind of uh, uh, reach out to like a, a group of artists um, that they're sort of drawn to or think might be a good fit and then just submit a very general theme like TV um, or summer. And then you just sort of create your own response to that. So my third piece in the show is uh, about television. And that was for the New Yorker. It didn't get published, um, but I still wanted to finish it because it was a lot of fun. Um, and it was kind of a slight nod to, well, one, uh, sort of commenting on how we consume television and media, um, but also a slight nod to, uh, Norman Rockwell's, um, cover for the Saturday evening post, which is the first, uh, TV antenna. Um, and then I'll go through really quick, but things I'm working on now is just, um, a series of illustrations based on an essay called The Island, which was written by Tova Janssen, who is the creator of, um, go back, the Moomin, Moomin Valley books. Um, she had owned a tiny little uh, cabin, uh, which she would paddle to from Helsinki in this uh, tiny island called Klofarun. And that's where she wrote her books. And she just, in her essay, kind of talks about the joys and the challenges of living in this place. And um, so again, just something I'm kind of working on. I think it'll be put together in a, in a zine format at some point. So, uh, but yeah, that's it. I'll, I'll hand it off, but thank you so much. Awesome. Jamie, thank you so much. It's so fun to see your new work. I'm really excited to see where that goes next. All right, Jacob, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah. Um, one moment here. Let me just share that screen. Um, okay. Um, are y'all? Yeah, it looks like you can see this. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, like Jamie said, thank you all for being here. Thanks for the wonderful opportunity. Um, so I'm really happy that Jamie shared some process work because I'm going to actually talk more about some some kind of feelings and interpretations of the work rather than, you know, sort of the step-by-step the -step of how I got there. Um, but uh, just a kind of a breakdown sort of of my work as well. So similar to Jamie, Allison, and, and Kelsey. Uh, yeah, I teach at MCAD. I've been teaching illustration uh, classes there for about six years now um, and moved to Minneapolis back in 2015 uh, for grad school and further sort of illustration work. But prior to that, um, I'm originally from Iowa City, Iowa, uh, where I attended the University of Iowa, um, focused on studio drawing, so drawing BFA and an English minor, um, both of which, as we all know, are you know financially lucrative and really employable skills. So that, though, means that ultimately a lot of my work and, and sort of the reason that illustration is especially, I think, uh, significant to me is this sort of idea of this real focus on narrative um, and, and communication um, and how that sort of is working alongside some visual component, right? And the idea of how an audience engages with this. So my own sort of practice uh, the ways that the sort of my pieces kind of exist, um, kind of branch in a few different directions. Um, all of it, though, is really research motivated. And by research, I mean, maybe that's me reading a lot of fiction and sort of thinking about a particular interpretation of a theme, or maybe it's actually concrete nonfiction sort of primary documents and reflecting on, um, you know, a particular circumstance in the world, right? So this kind of is embodied in areas like gallery work, so the idea of, you know, making artwork that responds to a particular call for a show in an exhibition, 
um, freelance work, so client work, whether that is editorial publication or like making, um, you know, posters for particular shows or events, um, album artwork for musical projects, things like that. And then grant-based work, so larger sort of projects that I'll apply to get funding for. Um, those are often sort of books or experimental narratives. Um, and then those might live in a gallery somewhere. But all of that is sort of this overall kind of collection of where my, my, my work can live. Um, from a subject matter standpoint, how this is usually sort of manifested is I, I usually describe my work as ugly, sweaty drawings of ugly, sweaty things um, or uh, essays that nobody asked for. Um, sometimes those things live together, right? But but what I mean by that is, is since writing is a major component for me and has been kind of increasingly so, um, I think a lot about the things that have resonated with me in terms of what I've been able to learn about and often writing and image coexisting have been a way to access particularly more emotional or evocative forms of content alongside sort of more concrete facts or, or written information. Um, so I've been really trying to think about how uh, an audience can learn or consider certain circumstances in a way that goes beyond like what a textbook would do, which isn't to say textbooks aren't important, but that's one way of experiencing a particular dynamic or collection of information. And I've found that thinking about this sort of like comic, illustration, visual art adjacent sort of learning is really important to me. And particularly with that subject matter, really thinking about um, particular kind of sociopolitical conditions in the places that I inhabit, right? So I live in the U.S. I've grown up in the U.S. I will likely stay in the U.S. And I, you know, I and my loved ones and strangers all inhabit particular social spheres and spaces and we're either subject to certain conditions or we're participating in them. Often it's both, right? And I think a lot of my worldview has been shaped by interrogating certain dynamics in the world. And that is particularly um, been formed by thinking about the sort of military histories of the US, sort of the legacies of imperialism and sort of violent oppression that often many folks are not even aware of because it's sort of baked into our histories. So a lot of my work focuses on talking about those things and unpacking them on a personal level and hoping that others can engage with that. So with that, I'll sort of look at the three pieces that I have and sort of point to sort of the motivations that sort of went into each one, right? Um, and I'm just gonna go in chronological order uh, real quick about sort of the, the genesis of each one. Um, so the first one, uh, this was completed around 2020, uh, titled Watching a Five-Time Oscar Nominee After 15 More Years of U.S. Backed Apartheid, which not all of the titles are that wordy. Um, but as with many of my sort of pieces, this was sort of a response or a reflection to another piece of content or circumstance. So um, this film by Steven Spielberg called Munich, 2005, um, sort of reflecting on this particular uh, sort of uh, CIA sort of comparative, it's Mossad, but CIA sort of this, this uh, intelligence agency um, conducting this series of sort of targeted killings in response to this sort of political violence that happened in the 70s. And it's a, you know, at the end of the day, this, this film is a political thriller. It's sort of like a spy thing. And the main purpose of it, I think, of the film is, you know, this heightening tension and sort of reflecting on how trauma kind of informs sort of these actions, right? And I think that there's, you know, a reason to make films about that. But something I was reflecting on as I was watching the movie is this question of when we particularly see movies that are focused on action or violence or global or political threats, um, where and when agency is sort of created, who gets subtitles, who gets to be the bad guy with the ski mask, and what the sort of information we don't have um, is doing for us as a viewer. So how we're sort of let to feel sympathy for certain circumstances and others. So this was a way of reflecting on that. So I did my own writing, sort of reflecting on how how this sort of, you know, is, is sort of shaping my, my sort of viewpoint, right? Um, the second piece, The Angel of Prisons, uh, this was uh, sort of kicked off. I had been, I've done a lot of work in the past sort of looking at um, kind of carceral histories and sort of like um, kind of prison advocacy sort of work. The U.S. is, of course, a very, very um, carceral sort of nation and that our prison population and the rate in which we use incarceration as a, a tool of punishment, the size of those imprisonments or the, the length of those sentences is 
is massively, massively uh, weighted compared to other countries. Um, so there was a particular piece in this, this larger kind of collection of travelogues by William T. Volman, um, where he just wrote four very brief little poems about an angel that visits four different prisons in four different countries and just has conversations with the inmates. And they're very brief, very lyrical. But having read that and reflecting on my own sort of relationships to that work, basically, in that sort of subject matter, I thought about, you know, sort of the mystification of prisons, how often we as folks, if, if you do not have contact with um, an individual who is in a jail, in a prison, or we haven't been incarcerated ourselves, often it's unclear what the circumstances of those places are like. And the more you dig, the more you realize just how, um, in many ways, disastrous it is for the people incarcerated there um, in terms of very, very infrequent access to health care, um, particularly when there are more extreme conditions like HIV AIDS or cancer or, you know, uh, certain chronic illnesses. Um, it, medication access is very, very sort of limited. Um, and that is both the case for our federal and state prisons, as well as um, our detention facilities for non-citizens, right? So I was thinking about this sort of visitation by this angel as this sort of mystical sort of event, but rather than sort of thinking about this annunciations, this like uh, illuminated manuscript sort of setup that we see in medieval manuscripts talking about like, um, you know, the birth of Christ or sort of these angelic visitations, instead this sort of visitation that is much more um, you know, focused on this sort of like hopeless situation. And baked into this um, kind of subject matter, a sort of composition, I have collaged all these sort of different documents, primary documents, so internal uh, uh, communications, um, studies, investigations of this, again, endemic collection, uh, this endemic uh, circumstance or, or sort of collection of circumstances of a lack of um, accessible medical care um, and support for people who are in these sort of spaces. Um, and then lastly, the most recent one um, in the show, this was 2022, um, Great Red Dragon, page one rewrite. Um, this was a friend of mine had suggested, and these are, I guess, as, as sort of a background too, if, if folks haven't seen these in person, these are about poster size. So 17 by 22 or so, this one is just a little bigger. Um, so we've got sort of space to read. So I view these as sort of broadsheets that folks can read on a wall. Um, I will often make print versions of them where the layout is changed so they can actually be distributed in sort of comics um, as well. So they can be sort of shared that way. But a good friend of mine had recommended I check out the uh, series Hannibal on television, right? Um, for years, I didn't watch it. I, you know, just didn't have the time for it. And also I have mixed opinions on sort of the spectacle of violence on, on television, what it's talking about. Um, but, you know, eventually I, I got around to watching it and, you know, I, I had a good time with it, you know, and it was an artsy well-made show, right? But, you know, reflecting on sort of these representations of violence and sort of what gives me pause, that also kicked off this thing in my mind of thinking about when when media, whether it is a book, whether it is television, whether it is a movie, whether it's music, when it will kind of address a particular focus on a particular area, in this case, like this idea of violent crime or serial killing, the, the question again arises, like what is being talked about and what is not and what makes quote unquote good TV or good music or good movies. And I was thinking, particularly in the wake of COVID, um, and the uprisings of, in, in 2020 in Minneapolis, this sort of idea of when we talk about violence and when we portray violence, how often is it in television that it's viewed as this, you know, oh, we've got a serial killer or we've got a monster or we've got this individual entity rather than a larger collection of structural problems, right, that aren't nearly as exciting to talk about. But what does it mean to know that violence increases in places that have less access to health care, housing and education? I mean, that, that is what produces most consistent violence in, in the spaces we inhabit, right? But this is, shows are not about that usually. Shows are not about, um, you know, environmental regulation. So ecological collapse happens slower, right? And so this was an opportunity for me to sort of reflect about this and think about what would the script of this show look like um, were these things to be talked about in a much more boring but accurate way, right? So all of this is to say with all these pieces, I think what I'm most interested in, again, is sort of my own personal reflections and placing myself within sort of these larger spaces that I 
am also part of contributing to and that others might be as well. And a hope that this might generate some level of reflection, um, not with the idea that these pieces solve problems, but more if they can be a way or an access point for others to think about these things in a different context as a starting point to begin thinking about other things. I think that's what's most important to me. Um, and in the name of, yeah, time here, that's just about 10 minutes here. So I think I'll, I'll kick it to, uh, to Kelsey here. So thank you all so much. And let's see if I can stop sharing here. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you, Jacob. All right, Kelsey, you're up. All right, let's see if we can get this screen share to work. All right. Sweet. Perfect. So I'm going a slightly different route than anyone else here, and I'm just focusing specifically on the project I included in the show. Um, which was a pretty large I, project, I would say, for me. Um, this piece is called 421 Days of Isolation, or also just Isolation sometimes. Um, and essentially, this piece is uh, made up of 421 8 by 8 inch paintings um, on hardboard that were made one each day, uh, starting on March 15th, 2020, and then ending on May 9th, 2021. Um, and those start and end dates kind of correlate with um, not specifically, obviously, the start of the pandemic, but kind of when it started to hit home for me what was going on and the start of news of lockdowns and uh, different things happening that you kind of realize that you're staying at home. So I kind of mark it as the start of isolating for COVID uh, and then May 9th being two weeks out from my second vaccination um, when you were um ending isolation somewhat kind of um to some degree but that was when I decided to kind of end the project with a hopeful outlook towards the future um so I kind of wanted to jump back in time and start by talking about kind of where I was at professionally at this time um and look at this project not only as uh how this project came to be and went into making it um, but also kind of how that has affected and how this personal work has affected my work in general. Um, so back in 2020, I was a uh, I was doing a lot of freelance work um, of various kinds, um, but a lot of work I was doing at that time was surface design for textiles, um, specifically for the brand Cat and Jack at Target. Um, so I was making a lot of work for kids, but inherently because of the printing process, a lot of that work was very graphic in nature. Um, and so you would see this reflected in my personal work as well, um, where earlier works of mine had been uh, leaning a little bit more painterly. Uh, by this point in time, I had ended up working quite graphic most of the time since that was what a lot of my commercial work was doing. Um, and I found that those two types of work would influence each other. Um, so a lot of my work looked like this, where it's very shape based with just a little bit of mark making within it. Um, However, on the side, I was doing, I had a lot of privilege to be able to do a lot of traveling at this time, again, before 2020. Um, and I would take photographs of the places I went to and then do these little digital studies. Um, since my work was mostly done digitally, I would do these little studies um, and kind of think about these landscapes. And so there was like an interest for me here, um, but it wasn't a large part of my practice in any way. Um, so then we get to uh, 2020 in March um, and I have a big, I'm a big fan of walks. And so I was always going on walks before this and taking photos, but not really doing anything with them. Um, so when we got to March 15th and I had a day where I didn't have any plans because they had all been canceled. Um, and I decided to sit down and do a painting on a photo I had taken um, like the day before. Uh, and so here is day one of what I did not know was going to be a project um, until I reached the next day and I also didn't have anything to do. So I did another painting um, and this continued until I was like, wouldn't it be funny if I did this for a whole month, uh, which then turned into, again, over a year of paintings. Um, when I first started out, uh, again, I hadn't painted in traditional mediums in quite some time. Um, I would say since like 2015 was the last time I did it in earnest. Um, and so these first few days for me were really like an opportunity to relearn the medium, re-get familiar with it, um, and also try and figure out how I liked to work with it. Um, and a big thing I found, I'm highlighting these days in particular, because these days kind of 
I felt the struggle of not really knowing the medium or what I was doing. And I still felt um, pleased with the final outcomes, but the process really felt like a struggle to me, um, especially day seven and day nine, where I was like in the middle of the woods and there's so much going on in those reference images I'm working from. Um, and I just kind of felt overwhelmed with the process. Um, however, let's see if I can actually get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, on day 8, 10, and 18, so again, still pretty early on in the project, I had some days that I felt really pleased with, um, where I felt like I was managing to kind of get the painting style that I was excited about, um, and that matched the work I was wanting to make with this painting. Um, and I realized uh, pretty early on that uh, my skill set with the painting, uh, tackling a complex uh, interior forest scene, it was too much, it was too much of a challenge. And so starting with some of these simpler spaces with fewer objects in it um, really let me kind of build my skill set um, in a way that was manageable for me um, before then later on. So this is day 206, 317 and so forth, uh, where I could then reinvestigate some of these more complicated scenes because I had kind of figured out how I liked to use the material um, and had also figured out kind of uh, a lot of how landscapes work and how I liked to simplify um, and like condense the information I was seeing in the reference images uh, to then replicate that in a way in a painting that I was excited about and felt good about. Um, so it was a really uh, interesting project where it was driven mainly because I was looking for a source of comfort um, at this time, but it was also a chance for me to uh, build a skill set that I didn't know I wanted to build, but then I found so much love and joy in like tacking on these challenges. Um, however, that being said, life is still life and there were still things happening. Um, school started up online and I had to deal with the challenges of that while still trying to do one of these paintings every day. Um, and so I came up with a term for myself called field days. Uh, where when you know you're going to have a busy day or if you're not feeling great, you paint a field uh, because fields are easy. Uh, they can be uh, just a couple shapes um, and you just play around with tone and value a little bit. And so I kind of knew and I had saved on my phone like a bunch of photos that were just of fields with pretty minimal compositions that when you needed one, you could take a field day and just paint a field. Um, they're not always fields. Sometimes it's a sky or sometimes it's a different kind of a lake or another simple composition, but I always found it really helpful just to know that if you needed it, it could be a day where the painting's really easy and it's kind of a break for yourself. Um, bit of a spoiler alert for how this story ends. Uh, I still do paintings every day. Uh, they're a little gouache painting now. Um, not always, sometimes I will do different mediums and explore different things, but I still paint every day. Um, and I still have field days because there's still days where you're just not feeling it quite as much, but I still want to show up and keep up the habit um, just because it's now like a source of comfort for me, um, as well as something to keep me excited about what I'm making. So I still keep a bunch of photos of fields. Um, I do a lot of lakes as well um, to kind of keep me uh, sane when you're having a busy day that you can paint just like three triangles and call it a landscape and that's good. Um, Another thing I found myself doing a lot when I was working on this project um, was revisiting the same areas. Again, I was pretty close to home, obviously, during this time for most of it. Uh, so this is Battle Creek Regional Park, um, which is over near where I live. Um, and I would go back to the same spot in that park. And this is from, again, day, I think, 11 through day 417. I was doing this same spot I would paint. Um, as a way to really start paying close attention to how these natural spaces are changing over time. Uh, so I observed not only how it changed through the seasons, um, it's funny, it might not make sense. Uh, so this is in March. Uh, and then there was a random snowstorm in April that I went all the way to this park while it was snowing just to make sure I could get a photo of it. Um, moving into spring and then summer, and then here we have the tree that is in this earlier photos or these earlier paintings was cut down and changed the view quite a bit, um, which changed some of my compositions to be more focused on the fence. Um, but it just kind of built in me this desire to pay close attention to these natural spaces I was visiting um, and document how they change over time, both over seasons, but also, again, in the pace, case of a park like this, how uh, 
like the natural spaces are being managed by the people in charge of taking care of that space. Um, things like controlled burns, um, logging, uh, where trees have been cut down uh, because of uh, infrastructure underneath the ground. Um, it's been a very fascinating just getting close to this single space and understanding how it changes over time, uh, including what it looks like now. Oh no, it didn't load. Oh no. Ah, oh, bummer. This was my punchline, here we go. Oh, okay, well, we'll look at it like this. Uh, it now has this sign and is not quite as scenic of a view because uh, apparently the space I was painting the whole time is actually the correctional facility. Um, and I did not realize that uh, the entire time I was visiting. So now there's a sign there and I'm hopefully it's not specifically about me because I did definitely walk over there a few times. Whoops, um, so yeah. Another space I reinvestigated multiple times during this project. Uh, again, I kept going back to that first day, um, kind of at days of significance for me. Uh, so on day 100, I reworked from the same painting to kind of see how I would tackle it differently um, after 100 days. Um, on day 365, I went back to the same spot and took a photo, this time at sunset, which was also um, interesting to see how the same day, a year later, the season, the weather changes, how the landscape changes. Um, and then day 421, so the last day of painting, uh, I went back at sunrise. Um, and again, it was in spring at this point uh, to capture what I kind of was hoping would be a hopeful look towards the future um, at the dawn and spring kind of new growth uh, of this same scene that on day one was much more cold and bleak. Um, so yeah, that is a little bit about the project. Um, just some process shots now. I'll try not to go too long. Um, again, looking at reference images I have and then the type of painting that I do from that. Um, and then the materials I'm using. Uh, when I do these paintings, I am working from the primary colors. So naphthol red light, benzamidazolone yellow light, never pronounce that right, uh, ultramarine blue, and then just titanium white. And then I'm mixing all of my colors from that. Um, and my workspace for the first part of this project was just a little desk uh, in the corner of my living room uh, with an iPad and a piece of glass from a picture frame that I used as my palette, um, and then cats to assist in the creation of the work. Um, so yeah, just some examples of again looking at reference images and then the final paintings that came from that. Um, again, I started out working from photographs. I would go out for a walk, take a photograph, and then do a painting because, again, it's much easier to work from a photograph in a controlled space like the indoors where you can really kind of uh, build those skill sets and build that uh, ability to work from a photo, understand kind of landscapes and how they work. Um, and then once I felt confident with that, and I was also starting to maybe feel a little bit bored or restless, uh, where I wanted to take on a new challenge, um, I started doing plain air painting where I would go outside and paint on site um, and take on the challenges that that way of working uh, posed, uh, which is you have to work really fast. Um, you have always kind of shifting conditions of is the lighting going to change uh, or is the weather going to change? Uh, this was me out in the Badlands doing a painting as a storm rolled in. Um, lightning striking in the background, knowing that I only had about 20 minutes to get this painting done before uh, the rain did start uh, and you had to pack up because that's the, the sign it's time to go. Uh, and then throughout all of this, I was taking each week, because again, I did not know how long this was going to go on for, uh, I would place all the, uh, all the paintings on my floor and take a photo. Um, and this went on as long as I had floor space, which turned out to be not a very large part of this project. Um, so on the last day in May of 2021, uh, I didn't have enough floor space or and my backyard also was not big enough to set all of these out. So instead, I did a vertical stack uh, to show just how many paintings I had made during this time. Uh, so uh, this year, uh, in November, when we hung it up, it was actually the first time I ever saw all of the paintings all together at once. Uh, so thanks again uh, uh, for the opportunity uh, to put these pieces up and take over an entire wall of this show. Um, it's been really amazing to actually see all of them together and see all of those days really kind of the physical space that they take up. 
Um, and again, as I said, I'm still doing daily paintings um, in a much more like kind of low key, less stressful um, and more just experimental and playful approach where I really take on uh, different mediums. I'm working in gouache now. Um, and then sometimes I'll do mixed media. Again, the piece on the right is an exploration of underpainting in acrylic uh, and then gouache on top just to kind of see what happens. Um, and yeah, this work has also really deeply changed kind of my focus in making art, uh, both on paying attention to the natural world and environments. Um, but I've also gotten much more invested in educational work and trying to bring more attention and uh, information to people about natural spaces. Uh, so this is a brochure I created uh, with uh, Preston Drum uh, for the Riverbend Nature Center as a part of the Minnesota Master Naturalist Program uh, to help uh, people visiting that park understand and identify uh, some of the common trees that you'll see there. Um, and you can tell it is also greatly shaped the type of work I make. So this is some personal work from recent uh, years uh, after this project where you can see uh, how my painterly approach has now influenced my digital work, um, as well as the focus on uh, environments and landscapes and how that is uh, also shifted how I work. Um, so yeah, things I learned from this whole crazy project I did um, is start easy. Uh, don't take on more than one challenge at once. Uh, add in complexity as you gain confidence. Uh, some of those early paintings were a little discouraging at times. And so giving myself the space to just take on one challenge at a time really helped me then take on more complex things later. Um, if a painting doesn't go well today, there's always another painting tomorrow. Don't let that set you back. Um, some days just the paintings didn't go well, but it didn't matter because you have endless paintings that you're going to make. Uh, build in breaks for yourself and easy days for when you're busy or tired. Again, you don't have to do a painting every day, but whenever you're making work, you understand where you're at um, and take on what you're able to take on so you don't burn yourself out with whatever project you're working on. Um, and then to stay motivated working on a project, find out what excites you and find a motivation to keep you interested. Uh, for me, as I started working on this, a lot of my early paintings were in very neutral, kind of middle of the daylight. And then as I moved on, I found out what really excited me and the challenge that really motivated me was lighting. Um, and so then I would seek out really interesting and exciting lighting scenarios uh, to keep me excited about making the paintings. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I have. Uh, thanks so much uh, for listening to me ramble about this project I made. I, I gotta say that your piece in particular, we've had so many questions about um, from the staff at Riverland of how you put it together. And one of the, um, Wade, the head maintenance guy was like, I know kind of how, because he looked at it because he does tiling. So he was, it was just really interesting how people um, relate to it. And because it's it's so large that you can, you can kind of like find an entry point for yourself. Um, and some selfies have been generated. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good thing. Um, Allison, do you, do we want to do questions now or? Yeah, I think that sounds perfect. Good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe we could just like go back and forth. Um, I shared the questions with you. Um, so maybe I will start with a question for Allison. Okay. And these are questions generated from um, drawing class. So drawing one and two and then a ceramics class. And so we just kind of compile them together. Um, nice. So a question for Allison, where do you get your imagery? Are you doing, is it from photos or is it kind of more from your imagination? Like how do you sort of, and you kind of talked about this a little bit, but maybe just- Yeah, I can talk about it more. I mean, and it it does kind of depend on what I'm making. So um, I can make things in a couple different styles if I am gonna paint something that looks, that has the level of realism that that painting has, I have to look at something. I'm not someone who can like generate realistically from my mind. When I generate from my mind, uh, it's very noodly and cartoony. So um, I do a lot of like screenshotting and compositing. So a lot of times I will um, pull images. I mean, in this particular instance, um, it was just a screenshot from a music video because I was painting it for myself. If I was doing that work professionally, I would not, um, 
kind of do a singular image like that. I would pull a bunch of things together so that it became something different than what it originally was. But since this was more of a just sort of like exercise of like painting foldings, you know, clothing folding and like weird little um, ruffles and like weird poofy hair and like, you know, just kind of like getting the, sh um, the shadows to look right. You know, it, I I did just use a screenshot in that situation. And I think screenshots are always a little bit better than photos in that um, like a photo is like sort of like a singular image that is owned by someone. And like, of course, the film is as well, but it's you're less taking someone else's momentary composed shot and are instead sort of building off a, a tiny little piece of something somebody else made and then putting it together with a bunch of other things. So, so yeah. Fun. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Jacob. Um, I'm gonna kind of combine two questions. Do you, how do you build your projects? And you might've talked about this, so I apologize if I didn't hear it. I was like checking with my class. Um, do you storyboard out your projects um, and then do you do a lot of sketching to come up with your ideas? And I think the questions came from just the density of the imagery and the text and the layering um, were very interesting to, to students. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and it's a good one, because yeah, the, the, the images are very, very dense and, and wiggly. Uh, so usually sort of the, the kind of trajectory of, the, of, of a project like the ones that are there, um, usually there is sort of a point of inspiration where there's either something that resonates with me um, or something I've been mulling over in my brain already. And often when writing is included, the writing will happen sort of separate of um, sort of images. Like I might have an image or two sort of in my mind that seems evocative of what I'm talking about, but the writing is almost me uh, thinking through or processing um, or composing sort of a, a, a way of talking about this thing that's sort of living in my brain, right? And I might have a form of like, okay, this I want to live on a wall or this I want to be in a book. So that might influence maybe the sort of scale of the writing I'm doing, but the writing, the writing sort of informs itself or sort of just plays through sort of until I get to a point of what I would say finish. And then I'll have like an image or two in mind that I'll likely be sketching around with. So in the case of that first one, there's that end of the the sort of the piece where there's this figure in a hallway stabbing something um, and that's kind of repeated. So that like moment was definitely at the forefront of my mind. So I like drew a few images sort of sketched around with that idea, thought of how I'd represent that. And then the writing was of course sort of informing that further. But then all of the other elements, they'll be analog drawings, so like ink, graphite, or Conte on sketch paper, like a, a larger sketchbook or Duralar, which is like kind of a water resistant film that I use sort of Conte. So you can like paint with it, it get sort of messy, but you can scan it. And I'll have a few different sort of elements and assets that I put together and I'll scan all of those in. And then in Photoshop, I do sort of a collage thing where I'm moving everything around. And that is sort of me more intuitively figuring out where I want things to be. And depending on how the narrative breaks down, like the the uh, the rhythm of the writing and everything like that, that might influence, you know, where there's space in the image or where there's overlay. And are there things that maybe I draw an entire image um, that I want to include, but I cover up most of it. So it's more of an echo of the original thing rather than the thing, right? So it's a lot of calibrating that sort of happens on the fly. So it's not exactly storyboarded in like a way that like a filmmaker or like a comic artist would do where they make their lives easier because they know what the hell they're doing. Um, instead, it's me more like, okay, here are all the things I think are important. Now I need to figure out how they relate to one another in a way that like um, seems seems uh, relevant to what I'm trying to say. So, yeah. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, it opens it up a little bit too because I was, I was curious too. I'm like, how do these... Because there are so many different things coming together and it does feel so um, visually rich. I was just like, how does this come to be? <laughs> um, the the next question is for Jamie. Um, do, 
I, that's the best way to say this. How do you experiment with your color palettes? And you did kind of talk about this at the beginning. Um, do you try different ones or do you have the colors figured out before you, you know, start your process? Um, so usually I don't have it planned out. Um, sometimes I will for like color palette inspiration. Um, I might like build off of a photograph that I've taken like out for a walk or something. Um, or I'll use, um, there's a, like a couple different like color palette sort of generator, uh, sites like, uh, color, I think it's color.adobe, um, which can be really, um, helpful. You can um, actually upload like a photograph that you've taken and then it will generate a color palette based on, um, just color theory. Um, so that can be really useful. Um, otherwise sometimes I'll start with, um, uh, maybe local color, and then I'll go into Photoshop and use the hue saturation slider to kind of arrive at more sort of unexpected um, palettes and solutions. But um, yeah, I usually try to um, work through like a couple, at least like two or three little color roughs before um, committing to a final um, palette. And yeah, that's usually how I go about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the next one is for Kelsey. And you did talk about how the project manifested. Like the question was really, did you plan the entire piece out or did it happen organically? Um, which you, you pretty much talked about. So, um, and you did talk about your palette quite a, like you even showed us the palette. So I'm going to move to the third question. Did you ever get fatigue from the project and just keep going? <laughs> yeah, no, there's definitely days that you were like uh, uh another one um or you start to feel like you've run out of ideas or you've especially in certain seasons like usually in the middle of summer and then in the middle of winter I'd be like I'm really tired of I I personally like painting winter I don't like painting summer which is a weird thing to say uh but so you'll notice if you look at the wall sometimes you'll get seasons and there's a lot of similar paintings and then suddenly there's like a random Iceland or like in the middle of winter, there's the middle of summer. Uh, and those are days where I was like, I need a break from this thing I've been doing constantly. And so instead of trying to be like, I'm burnt out on painting, I need a break from the painting. It was I'm burnt out on whatever I'm doing with the painting. I need to shift gears and find something I'm excited about. Um, and so sometimes that was a different location, a different challenge. Um, that was the switching to plain air painting was I was like, I've you know, I'm so tired of painting from these photographs, I need a different challenge. Um, and then even it was changing my location. Uh, even when I was working from photos during the summer, I would go paint outside, even if I wasn't painting uh, directly from observation outside. Uh, so finding ways to just like mix up what you're doing was really helpful. Um, and then for me now, uh, with my continuing the daily painting practice, it's changing up subject matter. Um, so like I'm doing uh, paintings of my friend's cats um for fun as Christmas presents but also so I'm still you know mixing up what I'm doing and what I'm practicing um so that is one way that's really helpful other times it's just been recognizing when you're getting tired um physically mentally with the project and that's when I would be like we're just going to do some like 20 minute paintings that are you know here's the field here's the sky and you know you're good for today and you can go think about something else um but yeah, so it's really kind of knowing what's going on for yourself. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, I've got a um, another question for Jamie. Do, and you may, I apologize if you um, expanded on this in your talk. I just might have missed that part. Do you mostly work digitally or do you use any other media or do you have any other favorite media? Um, I'm a huge digital fan. I think it kind of comes down to time and maybe a little bit because I'm like a perfectionist. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe to my detriment, but yeah, I loved, I love digital. Um, uh, but I do, I showed a couple of slides where um, I do enjoy like combining um, like traditional sketches or making like textures traditionally um, and scanning them in and combining those in Photoshop. But um, yeah, it's kind of a, like mostly digital, but I do enjoy bringing in like textures and sketches. Um, but I also do really love gouache and like seeing Kelsey's work <laughs> really kind of motivates me to want to kind of get back into that. Um, so yeah. 
I've just got a couple more questions. Um, I've got one for Jacob. This one's, we always get this question, but I do think it's, it can open up some interesting things. What inspires you? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm mostly laughing because I think when people see my work, it's like, man, why do you get out of bed? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as far as like inspiration is concerned, I mean, I do sincerely think that like, there's this like intersection between sort of recognizing like my own personal interests, right? With which, you know, growing up are like history, um, monsters, you know, like horror, like genre sort of stuff, you know, um, and, and to, you know, to a degree, just like a certain level of like humor, um, which maybe sounds weird, but I mean, I think humor is humor or at least some level of, of, uh, a different way of looking at things that is not just utter despair, I think is important to me. Um, and then that sort of coupled with like recognizing that like, you know, whether I'm listening to music, whether I'm listening or reading a book, whether I'm watching films, I mean, all of these are ways of sort of sharing personal experiences or sort of like viewpoints of the world. So I don't know, I think that I like drawing enough. And in the same way that like Kelsey and, and I mean, everybody here, but I think Kelsey's piece is really, you know, evocative of this is that like drawing can this can be this like reflective skill that of course is physical but it's also something that like puts you in a particular headspace and allows you to sort of either reflect or or just take time to spend with something so i think drawing is a vehicle for me to understand other things so you know i read a lot so i've always got books that in the back of my mind i'm like oh it'd be great to make a piece reflecting on this or representing something in this moment or you know i'm watching this movie this is an interesting viewpoint like what do i think about that or this other artist is making this work how how could i sort of get at what they're bringing out of me um so i i have a lot of sort of spinning plates all at once but honestly like um you know often works of fiction and poetry are, are very important I mean, particularly sort of speculative fiction but not not always but um genre fiction can be really interesting um, you know, uh, same with film, um, but history as well, because I think the minute you start learning about things that you didn't know existed, um, I think for me, at least my brain sort of like you get this like, oh, my God, like, does everybody know this? Like, why was I kept in the dark? Or like, am I the only one that knows this? And that's that's really generative for me. So, yeah. Cool. Um, I have two more questions. One is for Allison. What is your favorite thing to work on for yourself? Me unmute. Um, I think I really love making stuff that isn't really for anything. Like I, I don't know why. I think it's because there's no pressure. So like weird little experiments. Um, I teach a class at MCAD called Illustrated Notebook, and I love that class because it's just like, what if I glued some stuff in here, and then what if I painted on top of that stuff, and then what if I cut that out? And so like things that just kind of like just like lead me down a road of trying more things. Um, and I think I am to my own detriment, maybe a little bit like allergic to making things the same way all the time. And so like the joy of making stuff in your sketchbook is it doesn't matter because it's just for you. You're just, you know, trying things, playing. Yay. And then there was a, a in the Q&A, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm just going to read this out. Stephanie says, it was wonderful to see your work and hear your thoughts. Thank you for bravely and impressively illustrating the diversity of images and ideas. The Zoom made me wish I was still teaching so I could share your work and ideas with students. It also inspires me to get back to my own art. Um, I love that. I always feel like when I see great work, and this is kind of leads me to my last um, thought for, for Kelsey. It's really more of a thought than like a question. I get like itchy, like my wrists will feel like it's time to draw or like, you know, like it's a physical manifestation. So um, I do a lot of plein air and I was just very um, number one, impressed by the scale of the work, but very honored that you shared it in its full blossom form with us. So thank you for doing that. It was just like such a feat. And as a plein air painter, I'm like, I could never do that many. <laughs> it's like, it's just met, it's like very tiring, you know, and fatiguing um, to put that kind of energy out there. So 
just kudos, kudos to you. Um, any other questions, thoughts from folks? Um, thank you, thank you so much for sharing all of your thoughts, process, and work with us. The gallery is open till the end of the month, 10 to 6. So thank you. Amazing. Thanks, Laura. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You well. Thank you, too. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.